Robert Downey Jr. was the coolest of the Brat Pack. Let's just say that. Robert Downey Jr.'s reputation has developed in a fantastically strange fashion. I mean, he was the first SNL cast member to be nominated for a lead actor Oscar. Robert! 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 Who's Robert Downey Jr.? I mean, he made a couple of films. This guy's going to star in as Charlie Chaplin? And this is actually a message to every director who will ever direct him. Shut up, back off, and enjoy what he gives you. His drug problems were such that we, for a couple of years, we saw more pictures of him at the Malibu court talking to judges than we did any movies at the multiplex. You understand all of the consequences of your plea? Yes, I do. Whenever you start using heroin, period, but when you're using heroin when you're working, I think it's you're not going to go to a good place. I mean, that's the beginning of the end. I just didn't think it was the end of Robert Downey Jr. career-wise. I thought Robert Downey Jr. would wind up being dead somewhere. Everyone roots for him, and everyone wants him to succeed. You know, I hate to throw that word genius around. It's almost like a joke. Everyone in Hollywood's a genius. This guy, on the other hand, is awfully creative. He's a real force. In the mid-90s, Robert Downey Jr. was best known as a gifted actor struggling with addiction and completely bent on self-destruction. I think the average person in the street, if you say Robert Downey Jr. to them, they're going to think very talented actor who had drug problems and spent a lot of time in jail and was a troubled guy. Robert Downey Jr. is somebody who's thought of as a really groundbreaking actor, a guy who takes risks, somebody who has really lived on the edge his whole time in Hollywood. So I thought Robert Downey Jr. would wind up being dead somewhere. Robert Downey Jr. is clean and sober, and the star of a blockbuster superhero film franchise. An actor who once terrified the studios with his reckless lifestyle has spent the better part of the last decade rewriting his legacy. With the substance abuse, endless court appearances, and prison time behind him, Downey has finally begun to realize his full potential. I think for a couple years there, he became a sort of punchline for jokes about drug addicts. And I think in the last couple years, that's faded away. Robert become committed, and that's all that's happened, is he's now committed to a drug-free lifestyle. He's dedicated to his sobriety. He calls himself a soccer dad. He's really interested in raising his son and being a good role model and being a good husband and just kind of going through life and not falling back into his old habits. Well, they'll find I'm not under the influence because that's no longer an option. This is too much fun doing stuff like this. Robert had a bit of a rebirth, almost. He's a changed man. He was once on the fast track to becoming another tragic cautionary tale. But Robert Downey Jr. managed to survive and reclaim both his personal life and his career. When you talk about his comeback nowadays, it's almost passe. I mean, he's, he's back. He's come back. Right now, I'm just enjoying the way things are going. And I, I certainly wouldn't want to imagine that I've arrived anywhere, but I'm certain, you know, I'm moving, and that feels good. Robert Downey Jr was born in New York's Greenwich Village on April 4, 1965 to underground filmmaker Robert Downey Sr. and actress Elsie Downey. I don't think Robert Downey Jr. had an Aussie and Harriet childhood. I think he had a much more sort of hippie, freaky, cool uh, childhood. Robert grew up in this very bohemian culture. His father was an underground filmmaker, made a lot of sort of strange films, like one called Pound, that had people playing dogs. Robert appeared in that movie when he was only five years old. So this is the kind of atmosphere that Robert Downey Jr. grew up in, which was New York, bohemian, artistic life. And this obviously had an enormous effect upon him. Filmmaking wasn't the only thing that Robert was introduced to at a young age. Robert Downey Jr. says that it was his father who actually introduced him to drugs, you know, gave him his first hit of marijuana when he was like eight years old. Robert Downey Sr., some would say maybe he wasn't the best father, um, but he certainly imparted his son with a lot of gifts, the gift of the gab and a sense of adventurousness. And that just simply can't be overstated as, as a positive. It can't be. Because so many actors, the vast majority of actors, will play it safe. Robert knew from an early age that he wanted to act in movies. So in the early 80s, when his parents split up, Robert followed his father to Hollywood. Small film roles and an intense romance followed almost immediately. 
One of the films that Robert was in when he was younger was First Born. He met Sarah Jessica Parker when he was filming that. They were co-stars and they fell for each other and they had a long relationship after that. So I think they had a lot in common in that you know, they, they had grown up fast. They had been working uh, as actors from childhood. They, they sort of had a similar experience. Of, you know, they clearly appreciated each other and understood what each other were going through because they were so young when they were experiencing fame. Robert's fame continued to grow. In 1985, he was cast in Weird Science by the king of teen movies, John Hughes. The role gained him entrance into the group of up-and-coming 80s actors known as the Brat Pack. I think a lot of people first noticed Robert Downey Jr. Uh, in Weird Science as it did lump him into that whole sort of Brat Pack scene. He was seen as a peripheral member of, of the Brat Pack, which seems you know, somewhat strange these days. Robert Downey Jr. was the coolest of the Brat Pack. Let's just say that, you know, he was a Brat Packer who really stood out. In 1985, at the height of Brat Pack fame, Anthony Michael Hall joined the new cast of Saturday Night Live. Robert followed his friend to New York City, and after an impressive audition, he too became a cast member on the live comedy show. I think it's fair to say that Robert Downey Jr. joined SNL at, at something of a low point. And there are actually some remarkably talented people in that cast, but for some reason, uh, it just didn't gel. If you look back on it now, it's hard to even believe with Robert Downey's career that he spent a year on Saturday Night Live doing, you know, these sketches, sketch comedy, and really bad sketch comedy at that. But aside from that, I have no complaints. I really don't. After a disappointing year on SNL, Downey returned to Los Angeles. In 1987, he landed his first lead in The Pickup Artist. The film was written and directed by another up-and-comer, James Toback. The first thing I noticed about him was how quick he was in his expressions. There was a liveliness in the eyes and a physical shiftiness and a readiness to spring that made me feel that um, you never quite knew what he was going to do next. All of the scenes that involve physical grace, he's very sparky and lively. There was great kind of dexterous movie made to avoid having his penis eaten off by the German Shepherd that uh, Vanessa uh, Williams was um, walking on the street. Hi. <laughs> I couldn't help noticing this great outfit and the way you walk, which is very exciting. And a uh, terrific haircut, which I love. And of course, this great looking dog. Hi. And had that dog had a neck that stretched up another couple of inches, Robert's experience on the pickup artist would have been far less pleasant than it was. Never one to take the easy road, Robert decided to challenge himself and his audience, playing the less than glamorous Julian Wells in Less Than Zero. Less Than Zero came out in 1987, and it was sort of marketed towards the Brat Pack fans. It was, you know, your favorite people, Andrew McCarthy, Jamie Gertz, Robert Downey Jr., and it seemed like, oh, this is great, I love these people, I'm going to go see this movie, and then you saw it, and it was really disturbing. I think that the Brat Pack took on Less Than Zero as a way of trying to show the world that they were serious actors, but could they actually pull it off? In the case of Robert Downey Jr., the answer is most certainly yes. Robert Downey Jr. plays this kid really who's handed everything by his father and just goes through it, becomes addicted to drugs and you know sort of destroys himself in many ways. I just want you guys to know that I know how much you've helped me. You know what I mean? You've helped me when I didn't deserve help and, and you've been so kind to me no matter how much I keep f***ing up. This is why I'm going to make it up to you for everything. All right? I'm going to deserve your friendship. What few people knew was that the role hit close to home for Robert, who had a deepening addiction to alcohol and drugs. I know that at one point, the director said to him, I want you and Andrew to go out, and I want you to get into some sort of trouble that Andrew McCarthy has to save you from so that you guys really feel that. And I guess that Robert got like completely smashed and was in the middle, of, like on Santa Monica Boulevard, like howling at the moon and peeing or something and and the cops came and arrested him and Andrew McCarthy had to like sort of you know bail him out. Roger Ebert said how real his performance was and in retrospect you think well you know it's not surprising in some ways. Few outside of Robert's circle of friends knew how bad his drug use had become offset. 
As long as he kept churning out quality work, even fewer would notice. I can think of singers and entertainers that the people around them really don't care what they're using. They want to know, can you get up there and sing that song? And once you've done that, you've given us our pound of flesh, then what you do aside from that, that's your business. I always imagine that it's really easy to blow it if you don't work your ass off. He was definitely a functioning addict. You can't point to movies and say, oh, look at that movie, you know, like he was sleepwalking through that movie. He was a, fun he was a well-functioning addict, actually. Sooner or later, it's going to get you physically, or you're going to display some type of a behavior. Something sooner or later will unravel. In 1987, following his critically acclaimed role in Less Than Zero, Robert Downey Jr. was the toast of Hollywood. But behind the scenes, his drug use was exploding, leaving him at odds with longtime sweetheart Sarah Jessica Parker. He was dating Sarah Jessica Parker, and she left him because she just couldn't deal with him anymore. Shortly after his split with Sarah Jessica, Robert met actress model Deborah Falconer. After a whirlwind 42-day courtship, they were married. Robert was also cashing in on his newfound stardom, but not necessarily picking the best films. After Less Than Zero, Robert Downey Jr. appeared in several uh, high-profile movies, Air America, Soap Dish, some of them did well, some of them did not. Uh, very few of them sort of remember today as particularly good movies. In the late 80s, he is taking roles and he's distracted by other things in his life, uh, and it's a tragedy. Few would have believed at that point that Downey was on the verge of the part of a lifetime. In 1991, Sir Richard Attenborough was casting his biopic of silent screen legend Charlie Chaplin. Hollywood A-listers like Robin Williams, Billy Crystal, and Dustin Hoffman read for the lead role. But to the surprise of Hollywood, Attenborough wanted Robert. People know what Charlie Chaplin looks like, the movements of Charlie Chaplin. It's a really tough role for any actor to conquer. And the studio did not want to go with Robert Downey Jr. I mean, Robert Downey Jr. at that point was really known for being on Saturday Night Live and some 80s teen movies. He wasn't the kind of person you'd think would be um, headlining a Richard Attenborough epic. I mean, he wasn't a British actor. He wasn't a theatrically trained actor. He was a complete shot in the dark in terms of casting. The studio ended up backing out of the film, which left Attenborough to go and raise his financing himself. And it took 10 months for him to do it. And while he was working on that, Robert had all this free time. And he read everything he could about Chaplin. And he even learned how to play tennis left-handed, how to play the violin left-handed. He threw himself into this role. And it really says a lot about his dedication to his job as an actor. Robert would later say that he cleaned up his act for the filming of Chaplin. In any event, Attenborough's risky move paid off. Downey delivered a stunning performance in the role, earning himself an Oscar nomination for Best Actor. I don't know what to think. It's my first, it's my first time. I think it was really, to Richard Attenborough's credit, to stick with Robert Downey Jr. There's this scene in Chaplin in the beginning of the movie, and he's just like falling down and doing all these acrobatic slapstick kind of comedy things, and he just nails it. Really, sir, this is too much. <laughs> Kindly remember, sir, this is the place of entertainment. Chaplin really showed that when handed those roles where he's required to be, you know, someone completely different, then he can, he can do it with a plomb. The 1992 Best Actor Oscar ended up going to Al Pacino for Scent of a Woman, but Robert's nomination made him attractive to some of the hottest directors in town, including Robert Altman. Altman cast him in his 1993 ensemble drama, Shortcuts. Actors love to work with Robert Altman. You know, if you say to Robert Altman, I have an idea for this character, he'll talk to you about it, it's a collaborative process, he lets you go where you want to go with it, and for somebody like Robert Downey Jr., that's probably perfect. If you give him free reign, this is the key, and this is actually a message to every director who will ever direct him. Shut up, back off, and enjoy what he gives you. 
I don't know any other actor where it's as clear cut. Let him show you what he wants to show you and don't impose anything on him unless he's open to it and asks for it. Robert took his free reign to nearly manic levels for his next role in Oliver Stone's film, Natural Born Killers. I actually love Robert Downey Jr. and Natural Born Killers. In many ways, while it's a morally dubious film, I think one, one would have to say, he's terrific in it. He plays this crazy TV tabloid style host of a show. And I mean, that, that film, by all accounts, was an unhinged experience. Robert Downey Jr. completely committed to that role, completely committed to that film. Life is a hunt. I've seen it. I was there when that hit the fan at Grenada. I saw it all go down at Grenada. And you could say it's an over-the-top performance, but if you're going to give an over-the-top performance, then I think Oliver Stone's Natural Born Killers is the, you know, the, the place to do it. By this time, it was clear that Downey had returned to his drug habit, and not even his first child could change things. In September of 1993, his wife Deborah gave birth to a son, Indio. But instead of straightening out, Downey was falling further into darkness, and soon started using heroin for the first time. Robert Downey Jr. has said that it's around the time of his performance in Home for the Holidays, which was directed by Jodie Foster, that he started uh, using heroin and also using drugs uh, on set. He's not responding at all, Mom. I have got the best trendy boost for you. It's apple cinnamon liqueur. We are pushing it all over the Northeast this year. It's a huge hit, but you get it first because you are a Del Larson oh. trendsetter. Spin, Mommy. Spin, Mommy. And Jodie Foster knew what was going on, and she actually staged a sort of mini intervention. And she went up to him and said, like, I know what you're doing, and you know I know what you're doing. He basically just blew her off. She wasn't upset with the dailies. She got the work, she got the performance, but she was probably very upset about, well, what's happening with him now? Where's, where's Robert gonna go? This is getting serious. In 1995, he appeared in the film Restoration, but his life was beginning to unravel as he started smoking black tar heroin and freebasing cocaine. Whenever you start using heroin, period, but when you're using heroin when you're working, I think it's, you're not going to go to a good place. I mean, that's the beginning of the end. In the summer of 1996, Robert's wild ways finally caught up with him. In the span of one month, Robert was arrested three times. Each bust was more bizarre than the last. The first where he's pulled over after going like a bat out of hell on the Pacific Coast Highway, clearly out of his mind on drugs and with a gun in the car. And then the famous or infamous Goldilocks incident where he uh, breaks into a neighboring house and lies down in the bed of a child of a neighbor and the police are called. 911 emergency, what are you reporting? I'm a strange man in my child's bed. He's unconscious. He is. He kind of shook up and he would moan and kind of talk, but he seemed to just go right back to sleep. Just a short three days after this 911 call, Robert was picked up by police again. They found him wandering Los Angeles after escaping from his court assigned rehab. To make matters worse, every incident was front page news. It could only have been embarrassing for Robert Downey Jr. how much coverage his, his problems got. Oh, the press was all over him. I mean, it was like, it was a field day. How are you feeling? Yeah. How are you feeling, Robert? Let us over this part of me. Anything you'd like to clear up, Robert? Hey, at least tell us that. How are you feeling these days? He has said that he wouldn't have lasted 15 minutes in today's culture of like, you know, just everybody is a walking paparazzi with their cell phone and their digital cameras. When you're wandering into people's houses, you could be next minute wandering onto the Pacific Coast Highway and get, get hit by a semi. I mean, really, it was dangerous and terrifying and sad. At Robert's third court appearance in the summer of 96, Judge Lawrence Mira of the Malibu Municipal Court told Downey in no uncertain terms one more slip up and he would do hard time. He then ordered Robert to a lockdown treatment facility and three years probation. I think he went through some hardcore rehab. I think at least half a dozen, if not a dozen different cycles of serious rehab, some time in sobriety and then relapse and then collapse. Despite the fact that this was real rehab and not a celebrity spa, 
Some griped about preferential celebrity treatment when Robert was allowed to leave the facility for work. He starred in the offbeat comedy Hugo Pool and another film written specifically for him. James Toback, like the rest of the country, saw what Robert was going through, and he decided to help in the best way he knew how. Somehow seeing him in that courtroom, I thought, this is a good time to write something for him. Two Girls and a Guy was a big deal in that uh, it came at a moment when Danny was in a lot of trouble. And the fact that Toback would hire him to make this film, I think really helped him a lot personally. I do think it was important for him to be working then, but that wouldn't be a reason to make a movie. It, and nor he, would he have wanted it that way. He was in no way looking at anything as a gift, a handout, a charity case. Shot in less than two weeks in one location, Two Girls and a Guy was a perfect showcase for Robert's talents. Downey rose to the occasion and gave one of the most harrowing performances of his career. In Two Girls and a Guy, he plays a guy who gets busted. He's got two girlfriends who ab accidentally meet each other. And so instead of like breaking up with him, they sort of stage like this weird emotional intervention. There's an emblematic moment in Two Girls and a Guy where uh, Robert Downey Jr. Um, has, I mean, he's just, he's lied, he's fooled people, he's fooled them both. And he's standing in front of a mirror and he's, he's berating himself. Stop the everyone. Stop deceiving him. Stop doing this. And yourself, too. You should promise me this right now. Like the real promise, the real deal now. There are a lot of actors who are ready to spill the beans in a way that makes you a little embarrassed. I don't know of any other actor who goes that far in giving up what there is to give up and can do it in a way that is hypnotic and in not in any way cloying. That's the great gift. With two girls and a guy, Downey showed Hollywood he was ready to work. However, his checkered past made it difficult for him to get on-set insurance. The insurance companies really don't want to touch him with a barge pole. He's being drug tested on an extremely regular basis. And frankly, um, you got to think, well, maybe he's going to fall back into to trouble at any point anyway. I remember one insurer calling me up, actually, and asking about him. And I said, well, instead of worrying about a lot of crap that you've heard, why don't you just look at the guy's record? He's always delivered. He's always been there. Regardless, Downey had to sacrifice most of his salary to pay insurance premiums when he took supporting roles in U.S. Marshals and The Gingerbread Man. But before those films were released in the summer of 1998, Downey relapsed and failed another drug test. Once again, he was back in court. Mr. Downey, if you want to address the court, now's the time. Yes, I may, Your Honor. Um, I don't know why, with the severity and the, and the, the fear of you, of death and of not being able to uh, live a life free of drugs has not been enough for me to not continually relapse, seek treatment again, relapse, seek treatment again. Downey pled his case, but Judge Mira had run out of patience. Now you got to understand here that I'm running out of resources to keep you out of state prison. Now, I am not going to just put you back in rehabilitation. Uh, I'm going to violate your probation in this case in a way, and I'm going to incarcerate you, and I'm going to incarcerate you in a way that's very unpleasant for you. I'm doing that because I believe if you understand that's where you're going, maybe it'll save your life. It may not. I'm going to sentence you to 180 days in the county jail. All right, Mr. Downey, I'll see you back on April 7th, 1998 at 8.30, this division. I hope this works. Thank you, Your Honor. So this was real jail. He went for more than 100 days. He got in fights in prison. You know, there were photographs of him in his prison regalia. I mean, this is not a guy who got off scot-free. In an incredible fall from grace, Robert Downey Jr. went from Oscar-nominated actor to inmate number P50522 in five years. And for the first time, Robert's personal life was taking a toll on his work. So around this time, The Gingerbread Man is released, in which Robert Downey Jr. plays quite a, a boozy private eye. And I think this is the point, really, where his personal problems actually become a problem in terms of perceiving the character. 
because his appearance on screen and, and, and his performance is actually met by laughs, uninten you know, unintentionally provoked laughs by the audience. And I think people were starting to really lose patience. I mean, he's got incredible talent, he's got good looks, he's got, you know, a career that most the people in this town would literally kill for. And I think people were, you know, they went from being like, oh, poor Robert, to sort of like, oh man, you know, give me a break. He was really losing a lot of public sympathy. For the rest of the 90s, Downey continued to struggle through his rehabilitation. For every step forward, he seemed to take two back. His drug problems were such that we, for a couple of years, we saw more pictures of him at the Malibu court talking to judges than we did any movies at the multiplex. This is when I think people were saying, you know, it's over. It's like, you know, you can't, he's not going to be able to resurrect this image. He's not going to be able to resurrect his career. I mean, he can barely hold it together. He's in jail, you know, and he can't hold it together. I told you that you violated the status of probation to go back to jail, and that's where you're going. Due to his three arrests and continuing drug problems in the late 90s, many studios in Hollywood were unwilling to take a chance on the troubled Robert Downey Jr. But director Curtis Hansen went out of his way to cast Robert in his new drama, Wonder Boys. Curtis Hansen really went about to have him be in Wonder Boys in a role that was like absolutely tailor-made for him. He's such a, you know, a dedicated actor that I think people thought if we can just keep him in these really great roles and keep his attention focused on the script, then maybe he'll stop already. Because Wonder Boys, I think, is one of, the, one of the very best performances he's ever given. And a very unique film, giving a performance that only he could give. I can't think of anybody else who could pull, could have pulled off that part. Uh, so subtly. I guess I just don't fit the new corporate profile. Which is? Uh, kind of some competence. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny how Robert Downey Jr. again and again manages to pull the rabbit out of the hat. Not by any stretch of the imagination that successful a film, but he's absolutely brilliant in it. Critics love the film and herald it as a return to form for Downey. However, upon the film's release, Robert was serving a year in prison after admitting to drug use, a violation of his parole. When Downey was released in August of 2000, he took a role on the television show Ally McBeal, a move many saw as a step down from feature film work. There's no doubt that it, it did seem like stunt casting to put Robert Downey Jr. on, on Ally McBeal. You know, he was a, a, a troubled character in real life, and, and you'd put on a show where there was a lot of trouble characters. But he was really, really good and, you know, he won the, the Golden Globe for it. I just wanted to uh, uh, share this with my fellow parolees, I mean nominees, and just say that this really means a lot and it's been really uh, a great pleasure working on the show. There was some comment that I read that as though it, they'd done him a favor by giving him that job, I found to be rather nauseating in its uh, self-congratulation and unctuous to a degree that made me gag. I think Robert was not set out to do television sitcoms. He thrives on challenges and he thrives on tests of his capacity. I don't believe that role tested anything other than his patience. In the absence of a professional challenge, Downey became depressed and turned to drugs. His downward spiral culminated in the famous Lost Thanksgiving Weekend in Palm Springs. It was really, really awful stuff. He had hit you know, a, a low that many people never come back from, never walk away from, that's for sure. It's also important to say, you know, people criticize Robert Downey Jr. Why can't he turn it around? The fact is, when you're in the throes of an addiction like that, and he clearly was, it's very difficult to turn it around. This guy was really, really sick. Downey's lost weekend put him back in jail for possession. He quickly posted bail and returned to work, but he still had further to fall. A few months later, he was picked up by police for his fifth drug-related arrest when they found him stumbling around a shady part of L.A., clearly intoxicated. Robert Downey Jr.'s latest arrest was the last straw for the TV show Ally McBeal. He was fired yesterday, shortly after being arrested for suspicion of drug use in Culver City, California. His parole officer put him in rehab and set up a six-month stint in a drug treatment center. Downey has two court dates next week, one for this charge and one for his arrest last November. Roberts even said that this is the point where he hit rock bottom. 
You know, not only did he have this embarrassment with the arrest, but Deborah Falconer had enough with him. And even though they were estranged at the time, she said, that's it, we're done. I'm taking our son. I can't have this anymore. No one could believe that he was given this opportunity to succeed, and he just blew it again. With his family gone and his career in shambles, Robert took a year to focus on recovery and getting his life in order. Slowly, with rehab and therapy, he came to understand how to control his demons. You have these gauges that start flashing. You know, you can tell when things are malfunctioning, and usually, it you know, it's in the form of, of feelings. And hopelessness was a real great thing for me to play with. You know, I don't think I know too many people more self-aware than Robert is, less self-delusional. He hung on to his addictions for as long as he needed to, chose to, wanted to. He hung on to that path of flirtation with destruction for as long as he wanted to flirt with it. Now he's abandoned that for a wholesome, productive, seriously ambitious, dedicated personal and professional life. There was a, a conversation that I had with Robert. And this was just prior to him going, having to leave our facility. I knew that he wanted to live clean. I can't say that about everybody that's sitting in this facility right now. I can't say that. But there's something about one addict talking to another where you can tell that he really wanted to live a drug-free life. In 2002, after a year of rehab and soul searching, Robert Downey Jr. was ready to return to work. Taking a chance on the talented actor, Joel Silver cast him opposite Oscar winner Halle Berry in Gothica. Well, Mel Gibson was the one who called Joel Silver and said, this kid is clean now, he really seriously is clean. And Joel listened to him and that's when he cast him in Gothica. Downey had to put up most of his salary to pay for his insurance. But this job wasn't about the money. It was about putting his career and his life back on track. Both of those goals got a huge jump start when Robert met one of the film's producers, Susan Levin. She's a very calm person. She's a very lovely person. You know, she's not somebody who's going to go out and party. She's a, a very dedicated professional herself. You know, she's about the work, and I think that that's a really good influence for him. And I think he's deeply helped by his relationship with his wife, which is the first, in my observation, really productive, healthy, helpful, harmonious relationship he's had. Now Downey credits his recovery to Susan Levine, and that has been the sustaining relationship of his life ever since. That and of course his relationship with Indio, his teenage son, and he's finally being able to be a father after many, many years of difficulty. Since getting clean, Downey's creative juices continued to flow as he showcased his musical talents on a full-length album, The Futurist. It's really good. I was looking for reasons not to dislike it, but to kind of dismiss it a little or to play it down or to say, hey, guy's a great actor, or he can write really well, or he could do this, but he's not a musician. He, he sings beautifully, plays well, and you know, I hate to throw that word genius around. It's almost like a joke. Everyone in Hollywood's a genius. Everyone everywhere is a genius. This guy, on the other hand, is awfully creative. He's a real force. With his demons under control and his personal life in order, Downey was on the brink of his most successful period yet. Although Gothica was an important film to Robert personally, it was rejected by audiences and critics alike. Downey needed to land the role that would cement his return with both studio execs and fans. In 2005, he got his chance, along with two other Hollywood cast-offs. It's almost like a studio nightmare, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, in many ways. It was written and directed by Shane Black, who wrote Lethal Weapon, who, who could have disappeared off the face of the planet, really. And, and then it stars Val Kilmer, who, you know, is an interesting guy, it has to be said, and, 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 and perhaps you know, people aren't always rushing to employ him necessarily for various reasons. And obviously then Robert Downey Jr. And both guys with histories, and both guys who... You know, at one time were the next big thing for so long that, that in many ways I think they were both disappointments in general. They were like a two-man ensemble. They were fantastic together. I loved that movie. One of my favorite Robert Downey Jr. shots is wordless, actually. It's just a shot of him standing outside his apartment smoking and 
Nobody smokes as great as Robert Downey Jr. It's sort of a resignation and a sort of a willingness to go on, uh, a sense of humor, self-deprecation. It's all wrapped up into this single shot of, you know, just an actor being. Um, and that, that's what, how I'll always remember Robert Downey Jr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang didn't set the box office on fire, but it did announce that Robert was back in a big way. New offers came pouring in, including the juicy role of Paul Avery in David Fincher's 2007 thriller, Zodiac. Zodiac was a really big movie for him because it's a really big movie. I mean, in that role, he plays a journalist who obviously, you know, imbibes a bit more than he should. Um, it was chilling to watch him do it. And in fact, when I was watching him going, God, I hope that this was okay for him, <laughs> you know? And I mean, he's perfectly cast as a reporter who goes too far and burns out. But he just as easily could have played Jake Gyllenhaal's character. He's had so many chances, he's blown so many chances, Robert Downey Jr., that I think nowadays when he gets a plum roll, he takes it more seriously and he commits himself even deeper than he ever has. I really, really enjoyed Zodiac, but there's no doubt that the first half of the film belongs to Robert Downey Jr. And when he kind of disappears, although it's still a good film, you're sitting there going, I wonder when Robert Downey Jr. is going to come back. He also left audiences wanting more, with his memorable 90-second cameo in the film Lucky You and as Principal Nathan Gardner in Charlie Bartlett. Speaking with Esquire magazine, the actor also cleared the air about false rumors claiming he had been diagnosed as bipolar. With his comeback in full swing, Downey was about to step into unfamiliar territory as the star of a bona fide blockbuster. Downey donned the iconic super-powered suit of alcoholic genius billionaire Tony Stark for Iron Man, the second highest grossing film of 2008. The role of the brilliant but flawed hero resonated with the once troubled actor as well as audiences, as the film took in over 300 million in the U.S. alone. It was actually quite complicated and sophisticated, to tell you the truth. And I knew that we weren't just going to do a straightforward adaptation of a superhero um, comic, so we really worked quite hard to try to make it the kind of movie that a, a kid could enjoy and that an adult wouldn't feel like their intellect was being um, offended. He appeared again as Tony Stark later that year in The Incredible Hulk. But despite the success of Iron Man, the versatile actor continued taking risks. He stole the show as a white Australian actor playing a black man in the comedy Tropic Thunder. Downey received nominations for a Golden Globe, as well as a Best Supporting Actor Oscar, a rare feat for a comedic performance. What I think is endearing about um, Kirk Lazarus and, and Lincoln Osiris in Tropic Thunder is that there is no way that I could have read the script and said, it's Oscar time. <laughs> I was just hoping I wasn't, you know, shot at the premiere. 2008 was an unqualified triumph for Downey, punctuated by Entertainment Weekly naming him Entertainer of the Year and earning a spot on Time's 100 Most Influential list. The career momentum continued with a role as a journalist who befriends a homeless Juilliard trained musician in 2009's The Soloist. He also took on a role that seemed tailor-made for him as the world's most famous eccentric genius detective in Sherlock Holmes. He's really dedicated. He's also pretty eccentric. Um, he has his own sense of justice. We, we played around with uh, all the stuff the way Conan Doyle described, and we always tried to have it be at least half-rooted and that sort of stuff. It was clear Downey had reached a new level of fame when he was named People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive. In 2010, he starred in the highly anticipated sequel Iron Man 2 and played the straight man to comedian Zach Galifianakis in Due Date. Downey returned to Baker Street with Jude Law in 2011 for Sherlock Holmes' A Game of Shadows and also received the 25th American Cinema Tech Award. At home, Downey became a father again with the arrival of his second son, Exton Elias. Playing Iron Man for a third time, Downey headlined an ensemble cast in 2012's The Avengers and planned to wear the red and gold suit once more for Iron Man 3 in 2013. He was once known as much for his troubled life as his talent. But it appears those days are behind him now. It used to be the case it was Robert Downey Jr. He's such a great actor. Isn't it a shame that he's kind of blown it? Uh, and now well, I think a lot of people are thinking Robert Downey Jr., um, you know, great actor, period. 
I don't think any studio would have a problem hiring Robert Downey Jr. I mean, right now he's pretty reliable. He's in a lot of movies, and uh, he seems to have kicked the habit, so to speak. One hopes that he will continue on that road. It seems to me that most people who, who get a hold of a shot at, at real uh, recovery and stuff, they keep it, you know, they don't wear it like a choker, but a loose shirt that they don't take off. You know, there's, vigilance is really key, really key. I have never seen Robert anything close to his, I hate to use so corny a word as blissfully happy, but I don't know that there's a better one. He seems to be exuberant in his fulfillment as an actor, a husband, an adult, a fulfilled, free from addiction male. And uh, it bodes very well for a great future. One of the things about Downey, and, and like I said, I, I can't help but root for the guy. I think his best work really is ahead of him. And I don't think that's something you can say about many actors in their 40s. And, and I hope that that's the case. Yay, Robert Downey Jr. You know, he is, it's fabulous to have him. So yes, let's stop saying that he's back. He's here. And let's just pray he doesn't go away. <laughs> The ball is in, is, is in Hollywood's corner. It's in the industry's corner. This guy can do tons of stuff. Give him good roles. Give him good directors. Give him good co-stars, you know? That's, that's it. Right now.